if this is your first time here, you joined us in kind of a unique series. We're talking about, thank you, brother. We're talking about the return of Jesus. And last week, I kicked off this series by laying some groundwork that I think is really important. And so if you missed last week, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it because I, I, I put some things in place to make sure that we don't get led astray by uh, some of the more challenging content that we're gonna talk about this week. And um, before we get into what we're gonna talk about this week, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit at least about what happened in the news yesterday. And I'm gonna tell you, as a rule, I make it a point to not address the news cycle. I, I, I try not to preach the news cycle. Our teaching team, one of the things that we do is, is we meet, our lead team meets, and we talk about a year out about what we want to share with with you guys, what we feel like God is trying to do to us to, to develop us as a body and grow us. And so we plan out the series. So what we're talking about today might sound like we're talking about it simply because yesterday a, an Islamic militant group that's funded by Iran attacked Israel. And, and it, was, it was really, it's a terrible day. It's still going on. The country's at war. And so a lot of the content we talk about today People will associate with that and say, look, look that's, this, is, this is what it's talking about. And so I wanna address some of those issues in the message, but, but I, just, I just wanna tell you that um, we preach things as God gives them to us to preach. We don't necessarily just kinda wanna, wanna preach what's happening in the news, because there's always stuff going on in the news. If we focused on that, man, there'd be so many things that we miss about the word. But I think today it is, it is good that we're talking about this at this time, and the Holy Spirit does what he pleases, and he moves hearts. And he moves us even months and months ago to plan this on this day. And so as we get into talking about prophecy, can we just take a minute and ask the Lord to, to just kind of enlighten us? Because this is a very, very difficult topic. So would you just join me, join me in praying real quick? Lord, we love you. Holy Spirit, we know that um, you come and you, you, it says that you make your home with us, God. And Lord, you'll reveal all things to us. You'll teach us all things. And so we pray, God, that that would happen today, Lord, that there would be a revelation in each one of us about what your word says, about what it doesn't say, Lord, and, and about what we should do about it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, so I talked to you last week about how prophetic language is really difficult to interpret. Um, apocalyptic prophecies, stuff about the end times, those are particularly difficult. And in fact, there are four major systems, we're gonna talk about those later, of, of how to address apocalyptic prophecies. And I'll tell you, though, most non-scholarly people, they're going to approach prophecy in a couple ways. We talked about that last week. The first way that a lot of people approach this, just folks that come to church like you and me, is, man, this is what it says. I got it all figured out. I know exactly when it's going to happen. I've seen all the charts, and this is what it says. And here's the deal. Up to this point in history, everybody who has said that has gotten it wrong. Everybody's gotten it wrong. Everybody has missed it, uh, and it's not to say that they were malicious or they had nefarious aims. They just, they just weren't right. In fact, do you know that the disciples actually had their opinion about what Jesus said, and they were wrong too? Lots of them thought that Jesus was gonna come back before they died. Lots of them thought that it was gonna at least happen before John the Revelator died, and they got it wrong. So if they got it wrong, I think it's important for us to at least concede the point that we should hold these words just a little bit loosely. Amen? Yeah. So <clears throat> the other way that people approach this is they don't have a clue. Like, I don't understand what any of this says. It's super scary. We're gonna talk about some of the most scary points today. And so they just avoid it. But I think that that's, that's a, a, a failure on the other side because Scripture tells us that this is really valuable text. Revelation 1-3 says this. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, we're gonna do that today, so we're gonna be blessed, amen? I like that. Blessed are those who hear, we're gonna hear it, and who keep what is written, for the time is near. Like I said last week, when we read prophecies, this is super important. We need to look to prophecy for preparation more than we look to it for prediction. Preparation is why we should be focused on it, not trying to predict what's gonna happen. And so we're gonna talk about a lot of stuff about the end times today, and where do we get it? There's a lot of places where we get all these scriptures. So I think we've got a chart that we can show you up here, but there's a bunch of verses. If you wanna go through and study all this, this is the place to get it. Daniel chapter seven through 12, Mark 
13, Matthew 24, First and Second Thessalonians and Revelation. There's other places that talk about this. It's all over the Bible, but those are kind of the, the big ones that if you really wanna dig into this. So I'm gonna make an attempt today to go through the entire book of Revelation. And I know that's gonna be a challenge on a Sunday morning, but the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna talk about some of the big things that are there. So we're not gonna be shallow as we discuss it, but if we, if we dug into every single teeny tiny verse in there, we would, be, we would be here all year. So what I wanna help you see are the big things that are happening so you can kind of contextualize it. If you will, I wanna step back and give you the whole picture of this is what's happening in Revelation. So if you wanna drill down into some very specific areas, you can do that. Today, though, we're gonna get the big picture. And I'm gonna do that by talking about six big events, six big things that Revelation goes through. The first one, the first big event, is the first three chapters of Revelation, and that is the church age. So Revelation talks about that. It's, in fact, it's what we're living in now. It's a time immediately following Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. That is where we are living. And Jesus actually gives us instructions about how we're supposed to live. In fact, next week we're gonna talk about this section in a lot more detail. But it's where the Holy Spirit comes and he lives in us. He takes up residence in us and, and Jesus is literally ruling and reigning through us in our lives. It, it's, it's an awesome time of history. And in this age, we, we live in what oftentimes people call the already but not yet. There are things we already experience, but then there are things that have not yet happened, like the, the full revelation, the full advancement of the kingdom. And, and so as a result, with the Holy Spirit living in us, we have the power to overcome the bondage and the oppression that Satan exerts over this earth. And, and this is a time in history where God's kingdom, it's advancing. The gospel's going all across the earth and we're trying to fulfill the Great Commission. And, and again, what I said is Revelation deals with this primarily at the very beginning. There's two whole chapters that talk about how the church is specifically supposed to prepare for what's to come. And so next week we're gonna hit it, but again, this series is more about preparation than prediction, and that's one of the reasons we're gonna dig into that really, really deeply, because we want you to be ready. And part of being ready is sharing the gospel. We talked about expanding the family last week. We wanna, we wanna make this family as big as possible before Jesus, gives us, Jesus comes back. And in his longest recorded discussion at the end of times before Jesus' crucifixion, he actually um, talks about, in Matthew 24, a little bit of a sequence about what's gonna go down and how it's gonna go down. And this is what he says in Matthew 24. He says, and the gospel of this kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So that's, that's one of the big points is we gotta make sure that the gospel goes out and then the end will come. So what does the end look like? I already told you that some of the passages that deal with the end times, um, I already told you some of the passages that deal with the end times, but the parts in Revelation that we're gonna go into discussing today, um, the next big thing that happens is the rapture. And so, y'all have heard about the rapture? How many people have heard the word rapture before? Yes, most people, right? So the word comes from the Latin term rapio. It means to snatch away or to carry off. It's actually not in the Bible itself, the word rapture. We, we've taken that, we've adapted it. Um, and I told you there's four main ways that scholars, teachers, and theologians look at apocalyptic pro prophecy. All would agree that there is a rapture. There's this changing, this snatching away, this transformation. There is, though, disagreement on when and how and how it's gonna be sequenced with the next couple events that we're gonna discuss today. But the idea that, that, that Jesus' bride is gonna be raptured, there's, there's commonality on that. First Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17 says this. He says, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep, meaning those who are dead, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up, rapio, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. This is something that's gonna happen. 1 Corinthians 15 says the same thing. Um, Again, another letter says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we're not all gonna die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. That's what's happening to all the people who have died. And we shall be changed. So the people who haven't died are just gonna be changed. So the dead are gonna be raised. The people who aren't dead are gonna be changed in the twinkling of an eye to be with Jesus. The next great big event, and we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about this, is the tribulation. And this covers most of the text in the book of Revelation. It's actually chapter six through chapters 19 deal with the tribulation. Uh, It's probably the one that most of us focus on. It's the thing that we've seen in most of the movies, the apocalyptic movies, all the dystopian movies. It's like Revelation. And the word tribulation actually means great suffering. It means a trial. And so many people believe that this is gonna last at least seven years and what it's gonna begin with and why a lot of people are probably talking about this now. My wife was actually asking me, she said, Jake, did you, did you know, like, has this been like a topic that's been coming up a lot? Because my news feed is just full of stuff about revelation, revelation, revelation. Well, the reason is because there's stuff going on in the Middle East. And a lot of people believe that this period begins with a peace treaty. And it's a peace treaty that will end conflict in the Middle East. It's brokered by a powerful, charismatic leader who comes to power. Economies, governments get merged together. Daniel talks about it. Revelation mentions a three and a half year period where there's peace and there's prosperity and it's followed by another three and a half years where it's literally hell on earth. It is, it is terrible. Revelation eight talks about this. There's actually seven trumpets. There's seven bold judgments. We're gonna read through some of this. And remember, it says we're blessed when we read this. Revelation eight, verse six. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Everything that you see that's green, it's gone. That's the first trumpet. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A, th- a third of living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Again, terrible. A third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. It fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light might be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining and likewise a third of the night. Lots and lots of bad stuff. Darkness now. It seems like what you would see in a movie. The rest of the trumpets are equally dramatic. In fact, one of them claims a third of everybody living. That there's an angelic host that comes and slays a third of the people that are left in the earth at that point. Then we read about the seven bowl judgments, and these bowls are bowls that are filled with the wrath of God, and they're poured out on the earth. Some of the highlights, this is all chapter 16 in Revelation. I'll just give you some of the highlights. There's harmful and painful sores that everybody gets. Everything in the sea dies, not a third of it, everything in the sea is dead. The rivers all get polluted. The sun, it actually says, scorches people with fire. Like you can't get away from the sun, the sun that it's gonna hurt you. Then darkness overcomes the kingdom of what's called the beast. And then there's preparation for this great and final battle. There's an earthquake like the world has never seen. There are 100 pound hailstones that come down out of heaven and crush people. In fact, there's a verse that says, every island fled away and no mountains were to be found. There was such a crazy earthquake that it just leveled earth. Can you imagine the difficulty living in these times? I I, I think for us in America, this is really hard to get our heads wrapped around because we live in peace. Now your life, you may have some turmoil going on. So I'm not not trying to make light of that. But relatively compared compared to people in Israel right now who are dealing with rockets getting fired on them from Palestine, we live in a lot of peace. Compared to to folks who have to worry about people coming into their home and taking them out of their home, kidnapping them, we live in a lot of peace. We're not having earthquakes here in Virginia. We don't have to worry about the water being polluted here in Virginia. 
this is very difficult for us to, to understand. And what I think is important is to think about how difficult it would be following and trusting Jesus during this time. Because again, he tells us these things to prepare us for it. And he doesn't wanna prepare us to, to go away from him, he wants to prepare us to follow him. So that's the point. How, think about how hard that would be to follow him. When all this stuff's going on, can you trust anybody? Like you're all scrambling for food, scrambling for shelter, you're hurt, you've got sores. And so the big question most people wanna know when they read this is, when is it gonna happen? Like when's this stuff gonna go down? Or more importantly, they wanna know if they're gonna be here for it or not. I would love to know if I'm gonna have to suffer through that, wouldn't you? And so I wanna give you some scriptures that would lead some people to believe. Again, I've told you some of this stuff I have opinions on, some of it, it's just in the word, and I'm gonna share it with you. But there are some scriptures that would lead people to believe that Jesus' church might be spared from this, and I'm gonna start with those. Revelation 3.10 is one. It says, because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth to try those who dwell on the earth. So that's encouraging. I would love to be kept from that fiery trial, wouldn't you? I mean, if I had the choice, I'd rather not live through that because that's pretty terrible. Uh, there's another passage that I think is, is, is pretty good at, at delivering this point. It's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse one through eight. And it, I'm just gonna dig into this a little bit deeper than we have with some of these other verses. Verse one, it says, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered together with him, so the, the rapture, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. Don't get scared. Remember last week I said it's not a horror story. It's a love story. Either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. What he's saying is don't, don't get shocked when, you, when, when things start to happen. It seems like it's gonna happen. People are gonna send you letters. It might sound like it's from us. Don't, like this isn't gonna surprise you. Let no one deceive you in any way for that day will come, that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness. This is referring specifically to the Antichrist, the, 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 the leader who's gonna set things up. Until he's revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Again, Antichrist, he's gonna say, I'm God, I'm the good guy. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and you know what is restraining him now so that, he may not be, so that he may be revealed in his time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. So the one restraining the Antichrist, who's doing that? Who's keeping the Antichrist from coming back? It's Jesus. Jesus is doing that. Jesus is keeping the Antichrist from coming. And Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, and guess what Jesus has done? He sent his spirit. John 14 says, anyone who loves me, they keep my commandments, my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our home with him. And so the Holy Spirit is here in all of us as believers. So Jesus' spirit is in the earth, and again, what a lot of people would argue is that until those people get raptured, the Antichrist isn't gonna come. So they would say, this verse conclusively says that believers are gonna be gone because Jesus being here is keeping the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, from coming. It says, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. There are other verses that point to an opposite idea. And I'll tell you, just the general idea that Christians should deal with suffering, that we're supposed to live in a state where, where we kind of suffer for Jesus. We've talked about that a lot. Jesus didn't necessarily come to deliver us out of all of our circumstances. He came to teach us how to live in them. So a couple of those passages, if you wanna look at them, Mark 13, 27, but one of, the, one of the, the bigger ones is Matthew 24, 29 through 31. It says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. So he's given a sequence of things. And the stars will fall from the heavens and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call 
and they will gather his elect church from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So there are people who would read this and say, no, it's going to happen after the tribulation. So you guys, if you've studied any of this, you probably hear there's like pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. There's actually two views that deal with that, and there's two views that deal with other things. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into those later on. But that's what's gonna happen in the tribulation and where we as believers might kind of fall. And I know that this is really heavy on teaching today, but I feel like this is important for us as a church to get so we understand this content. So the next three big events, they're captured in Revelation 19 through 22. The next big one is the second coming of Christ. So in this passage above and all kinds of passages I shared with you guys last week, we know that Jesus is coming back. And I talked to you about this before, that this is not a terrible event for believers. It's not a horror story when Jesus comes back for us. It's a love story. It's great. It's going to be awesome. In fact, this event coincides with what we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to have this great big feast. We're going to have a party when Jesus comes back. It's going to be great. We're going to eat, which is what we always do when we're meeting with our family. We always eat. We're gonna celebrate the union of his bride, the church, it's like a big wedding party. And it's at this point that we read that there's gonna be a reign of Jesus with his people that's gonna last a thousand years, and I'm gonna talk more about the distinctives of that in a minute. We're told that this is gonna be a time of peace, that Satan will be bound, and he will not be allowed to deceive the nations anymore. So for a thousand years, things are gonna be good. There's not gonna be any war. Wouldn't that be awesome? You're not gonna have to worry about rockets. There's not gonna be evil in the earth in the same way that we experience it now. In fact, it it says that there'll be a time where the lion and the lamb lay down together, that children will be able to play over the dens of adders, which are snakes, and they won't get bit by them. Sounds like a really good time to live, doesn't it? After that's gonna come the great white throne judgment. So that's event number four. Event number five is the great white throne judgment. And I'm not gonna spend much time on this at all. If you wanna hear more about it, Go back and listen to our series we we titled A Life God Rewards. We talked all about that throne, that judgment, what it means, and how we as believers wanna wanna live in such a way that we receive those rewards when he judges us. It's gonna be great. And then the last thing that we read about sequentially in the Bible is that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So some of us think that we're gonna go to heaven with Jesus and we're gonna live there forever. That's actually not true. There's gonna be a new heaven and there's gonna be a new earth. We're gonna live with Jesus on earth. We're gonna get new bodies and we're gonna come back here and live with them. And that's a hope that he's given us which should encourage us. In fact, my um, seven-year-old, we we were on a walk. I was praying this week. We have some woods by our house and so I'll go out there and normally I don't let him come with me but he asked me this week if he could come with me on the walk and I was like, sure. So I go out there, we're walking around and on the way back, he asked me if I'm gonna die. He's like, Dad, when are you gonna die? And I was like, well, actually, buddy, I'm never gonna die. What? I'm not, and you're not either. Did you know that? What? And so I explained to him, like, no, if we believe in Jesus, we're gonna live forever with him. It's gonna be great. And I didn't go into all the nuances of what that meant, but the point is that there's hope for believers that we're gonna live with him, we're gonna enjoy him forever. So of all the stuff that we have went over today, there's still a lot of confusion. There's a lot of disagreement from people all over the world. In fact, I would tell you this. On our teaching team of the four views we're gonna talk about, we have at least three of the views represented on our teaching team, which is kind of cool. And here's the deal. We all love Jesus, and we're all gonna live with him forever. It doesn't mean we can't be friends. It doesn't mean we can't talk about it. And that's one of the issues with this. So so what I wanna do is I wanna show you some of the different views so that way you can understand it you can dig into some of these yourself. We can talk about it more if you want one-on-one, but I just kinda wanna give you, again, the different ways to look at these scriptures. So we've got a graphic I think we're gonna put up for you guys here. So the top two ones are probably the most prominent in the West. The top two views, uh, particularly in America, Baptists, Evangelicals, Charismatics, that's what they believe. They're they're premillennialists, and I'm gonna tell you personally, they're the ones that I most closely align myself with as well, and I'm gonna say that there are two and not just one because I think there are a lot of mysteries. Like I told you, there's there's two different views on when the rapture's gonna happen, which those primarily deal with. So historic premillennialism, this was a predominant view of the early church about the first 200 years. This is what everybody believed. Um, And one of the distinctives of this is that 
the rapture of the church was gonna happen after the great tribulation. So that's what they believed. They thought that things were gonna get really, really bad, then Jesus is gonna come back for his church. The, the second one is called dispensational premillennialism. And the words don't matter, but the, the, the systems of how people look at theology matter because it influences how you look at the world. So this is probably the newest of the views. It was made more prominent by the Left Behind books, and you can believe this without believing all the stuff that they wrote in all those books. And I'm gonna tell you, I personally find this one to be particularly attractive because the way that this one approaches scripture is, is from a literal sense. It's like, you read it in the Bible, it says that this is gonna happen, you're like, okay, there's gonna be a third of the rivers turned to blood, I just believe a third of the rivers are gonna be turned to blood. So that, that's how that view approaches it. It's just that it's literally gonna happen what you read. Um, there's some risks with these two views, though. And I think that it's important, especially in light of what happened in the news uh, this week. And one of the risks is that we obsess over the news. Because these are the views that think we know when everything's gonna happen. We have it all sequentially lined up, and so we obsess over the news. We look at it, we say like, oh my gosh, this is it. The tribulation's gonna start. Somebody's gonna broker a peace deal between these two nations. It's gonna happen. We need to buckle down. I'm gonna go buy my prepper food. I'm gonna get everything ready because the end is here. And you obsess over all that. You can also have a, a defeatist attitude because you expect things to get really, 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 really bad. And so you start treating everything with suspicion. And I don't think that that's how Jesus wanted us to live necessarily. Again, I'm not saying that the view was wrong, but I'm saying the risk of adopting this hook, line, and sinker is that you could think that way. The other risk is Jesus told us that people would say, look here, look there, this is a Christ, there's a Christ. And people have done that hundreds and hundreds of times. They've done that over generations. And a lot of times the folks that fall into this camp can lose credibility, not just for themselves, but for their entire faith because they're saying, Jesus is gonna come back on this day. You know that person is the Antichrist. How many, I'm not gonna use names. How many people, you guys have heard folks, you've seen folks online, this person gets elected to be president and you're like, oh, they're the Antichrist. You know you've seen that. People, get, people accuse the president of being the Antichrist all the time. And what happens when that person gets out of office and they move into retirement is they're like, oh, maybe they're not the Antichrist. And then what happens is the people who said that lose all credibility. It's very difficult for them to share their faith because they've come down so hard on a specific view. So the other two groups of thinkers, the two bottom ones on this chart, they hold a much different view of Revelation. I think it's important just to share it with you because it, it it's good to open our aperture a little bit. Um, many of them would say that much of what we read here today in Revelation, it's either already happened or it's just metaphorical. So the first view is post-millennialism. So these, these guys, I'm gonna tell you, I'm not a post-millennial. It's, it's one that I'm probably the least close to. Post-millennialists, um, they believe that Jesus isn't gonna return until after either a literal or a figurative 1,000 years. He's not gonna rapture his people, he's not coming back, He's gonna come back after all this stuff happens. And what they think is, things are gonna get really, really good here on earth. They're gonna get better and better and better, and eventually there'll either be a literal or a metaphorical thousand years. Either way, it's gonna be a really long time, and it's gonna be a golden age where Christianity has spread all over the earth, and governments are, are, are like infused with Christianity. It's like a theocracy. Everybody knows Jesus, everybody loves Jesus. It's, it's literally a golden age. The, the risk here is that you could fall into the trap of putting your trust in government and not in Jesus. Think the Crusades, okay? Like put that in your mind. That's kind of the time where this view was really predominant. In fact, it, it didn't start losing a lot of its steam until after the, the First and Second World Wars because a lot of believers in the West and across the world thought, well, maybe this is what's gonna happen. I mean, you have this nation who most of the people there profess Jesus, and they're, they're the, the world power, they're exerting a lot of pressure, and then you have all these terrible atrocities. They're like, man, when is this golden age ever gonna happen? And so again, they lost credibility because they put their stake in the ground so deep. 
I, I do think it, 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 in fairness, though, to this view, one of the things that makes it compelling is that you can't argue that things have gotten better over the course of history. You can't argue that life expectancy has increased, especially in the West, especially in nations that have, that have, have adopted a Judeo-Christian value set. In fact, China did a study. I read a book a long time ago called Jesus in Beijing, and China did a study, their government did, on what made the West so prosperous compared to the far and near East. And the conclusion they came up with was Christianity. And so they actually adopted a Chinese government version of Christianity. It's called the three self version. They've changed what the Bible says. And you can practice that in China freely. You can't practice Christianity according to this Bible. But they wanted to sort of adopt it and counterfeit it because they want the success that Christianity offers. So there are some things about that view that do make it at least partially compelling. The last view is an amillennialism view. And so what an amillennialist will say is that we're currently living in both a state of tribulation and a state of kingdom advancement. And so they're gonna look at the, ver the, the, the book of Revelation as a series of six or seven parallel narratives. They're gonna say, they're gonna say that, that, that the, the beast is Satan, that Satan was bound when Jesus was crucified and resurrected, that he was bound, that he can't deceive the nations, that the gospel can still spread in the earth. They're gonna say all of that is, is figurative. In fact, they're gonna say that some of these prophecies happen when the temple in Jerusalem was burned and, and destroyed in AD 70. They're gonna take Matthew 24 and say that's where that happened. And again, you can make some really compelling arguments and many, 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 many people in the world believe this. Roman Catholics, the, the biggest denomination out there, Roman Catholics believe this. This is what they, where they fall. Orthodox Christians, Lutherans, Methodists, they believe this. So if you've kind of lived in this evangelical bubble your whole life, maybe this will just open your aperture a little bit that there are other views. And the thing is, how you look at these verses helps you synthesize events like what happened in the news this week. Because if you come down really hard on what's gonna happen to Israel like post-millennialists and amillennialists do not, you're gonna look at that and you're gonna say, oh my gosh, the end is here. And it's gonna potentially cause you to be very, very, very fearful. But most important, it's gonna, it's gonna impact how you respond to people and how you treat others. Matthew 24, three through five, he said this. Jesus said this. He said, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things are gonna happen. Don't, we all wanna know that. And Jesus' guys were with him. He's like, the end of the age is coming. They said, tell us when it's gonna happen and what'll be the sign of your coming in the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, he said, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ, and they will lead many astray. This is primarily one of the reasons that I would say I'm a premillennialist is because I don't see that a lot of people have, have led folks astray saying that they're the Christ in, in, in modern times. I just don't see that that's happened. Um, I also as I look at this, Jesus said he told us the things that were gonna happen before they happened so that when they happened, we would believe in him. And so I don't see as I look through Revelation and as I look through Matthew 24 that, that a lot of these things I could say, oh, that's definitely talking about that because he told us the things so we could have confidence in him. And as I look at history, I don't get a lot of confidence that it, that it matches with Revelation. Again, there are people who love Jesus and we're gonna see each other in heaven and Jesus is gonna answer all our questions. Who would disagree with me? And that's okay, that's totally fine. Jesus warned us not to be led astray though. And lots of people are gonna be falling into that trap. But we gotta look at these prophecies to help us not fall victim to that. So 2 Peter 1, 19 through 20 says this. It says, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. That's what we should look for these prophecies for. They're like a lamp shining in a dark place. And I'm gonna tell you, these times, if and when they come, are gonna be very, very dark. And so we're gonna need these prophetic words to help shine lights for us to see what's actually going on. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So these scriptures aren't just random thoughts of guys who happened to be around Jesus at the time and, and wrote a nice letter. This is scripture, this is from the heart of God for us to see and to teach us and encourage us and exhort us. I was thinking this morning as I was praying before service how 
Jesus said his words like a, like a two-edged sword. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And I just realized that a two-edged sword, that's so important that he said two-edged sword because a one-edged sword has a dull side. There's nothing dull about this. It's sharp. No matter how you use it, it's gonna cut through everything that you're dealing with. It's gonna, it's gonna reveal things to you. Where I wanna land us today as we close is Matthew chapter four, 19, nine through 14. Again, this is the section where Jesus spends the most time talking with his disciples about what's gonna happen at the end of the age. And this is what he says to them. It's so good. He says, then they'll deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Again, think about that. Think about that time. Think about that season. You're getting betrayed. You're getting brought in before rulers. Governments do not want, do not want to let Christianity progress. They do not want to promote people who believe in Jesus. If you bear his name, if you are a Christian, that's what we do. We're a little Christ. We bear his name. You're gonna be hated by people. You're gonna be hated by many. Because, by all nations, actually, it says, for his name's sake. And it's gonna cause people to fall away. They're gonna betray each other. I mean, some of you have probably got church hurt. I don't think you have church hurts like what Jesus is talking about here. Imagine the people who you're expecting to sort of trust you and go with you through these trials, and they betray you. Like, inside families even. And this, this verse, this is the one that hit me. And I felt like the Lord really wanted us to hear today. Verse 12, it says, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Because things get bad, it's gonna cause people's love to wane. That's not what he wants to happen. That's not the kind of church that Jesus came and bled and died for, is that when we experience some tribulation, when we experience some suffering, when we see scary things in the news, when, when bad stuff starts to happen, that our love starts to go down. That is not how Jesus intended for his church to advance the kingdom and advance the gospel all throughout the earth. It's not the point. Verse 13, he says this, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Keep that love up. You endure through these trials that we're gonna face. You're gonna be saved. You're gonna be with him. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So regardless of what you think will happen and when you think it's gonna happen, Jesus' words are still relevant right there. They're still important for us to take and own and live with. Don't let your love grow cold. And as a church, I, I'm gonna tell you, messages like this are not my favorite. I like what I really like is inspiration. I like less information. Information's good, but I like it to lead us to inspiration. And, but this message was one that I, I felt like we needed to talk through because we need to get this information so that we can be inspired in how he wants us to live. So today, if I could give you just a, a little bit of inspiration as we end, just, just think about that. No matter what you're seeing in the earth, whether people are betraying you, whether you see morality as just getting worse and worse and worse. You know, sexual immorality is probably like the number one thing, regardless of whether we would think that, that like society's getting better as a whole. There's medical advances. There's all these kinds of things happening that are great, like life expectancy's longer. There's more peace. Maybe you would think that. Like, yeah, but there's just rampant sexual immorality all in our society. It, it's actually mentioned it's the number one thing that's mentioned in Revelation. It's mentioned 12 different times. But even in that context, we can't let our love grow cold. Just because you see stuff happening that you don't like, that doesn't synthesize with how Jesus called us to live, doesn't mean that we stop loving people. Doesn't mean that we stop caring for them. Doesn't mean that we stop calling them to a savior who's gonna invite them in to relationship with him. And by virtue of that relationship, he is going to change them from the inside out. No matter what sin it is that you hang your hat on, the lawlessness that you're super concerned about, there's gonna be plenty of it. There's plenty of it that's gonna happen here. It's gonna be terrible. 
Again, if you believe in that view of the end time. But for us as believers and for us as men of church, I want us to be a church that loves, no matter what. Amen? Amen. Let, let me pray for us today. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you've left us with, Lord, to teach us, to encourage us, to challenge us, God. Father, I pray that you would reveal things to us, God, that your spirit would illuminate what, what we need in order to go out and live godly lives, Lord. Whether it's the end times or not, only time we got is today. I don't know when you're gonna come back, Lord. I eagerly wait for it, God. I pray that this church eagerly anticipates your return as Lord to bring us home to be with you, God. We love you so much. Help us not be fearful. Help us be men and women full of holiness and full of hope, God. Full of love. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.